Chapter 11, The Human Eye and the Colorful World You have studied in the previous chapter about refraction of light by lenses. You have also studied the nature, position and relative size of images formed by lenses. How can these ideas help us in the study of the human eye? The human eye uses light and enables us to see objects around us. It has a lens in its structure. What is the function of the lens in a human eye? How do the lenses used in spectacles correct defects of vision? Let us consider these questions in this chapter. We have learned in previous chapter about light and some of its properties. In this chapter, we shall use these ideas to study some of the optical phenomena in the nature. We shall also discuss about rainbow formation, splitting of white light and blue color of the sky. Topic 11.1 .1, The Human Eye The human eye is one of the most valuable and sensitive sense organs. It enables us to see the wonderful world and the colors around us. On closing the eyes, we can identify objects to some extent by their smell, taste, sound, they make or by touch. It is, however, impossible to identify colors while closing the eyes. Thus, of all the sense organs, the human eye is the most significant one as it enables us to see the beautiful, colorful world around us. The human eye is like a camera. Its lens system forms an image on a light-sensitive screen called the retina. Let me repeat that. Its lens system forms an image on a light-sensitive screen called the retina. Light enters the eye through a thin membrane called the cornea. Light enters the eye through a thin membrane called the cornea. It forms the transparent bulge on the front surface of the eyeball as shown in the figure. The eyeball is approximately spherical in shape with a diameter of about 2.3 cm. The diameter of the eyeball is about 2.3 cm. Most of the refraction for the light rays entering the eye occurs at the outer surface of the cornea. So most of the refraction for the light rays that enters our eyes happen at the outer surface of the cornea and cornea is the thin membrane where the light enters. The crystalline lens merely provides the finer adjustment of focal length required to focus objects at different distances on the retina. We find a structure called iris behind the cornea. Iris is a dark muscular diaphragm, diaphragm that controls the size of the pupil. Iris controls the size of the pupil. Iris is located behind the cornea and iris is a dark muscular diaphragm. The pupil regulates and controls the amount of light entering the eye. The eye lens forms an inverted real image of the object on the retina. The retina is a delicate membrane having enormous number of light sensitive cells. Let me repeat that. The retina is a delicate membrane having enormous number of light sensitive cells and the eye lens forms an inverted real image of the object on the retina. The light sensitive cells get activated upon illumination and generate electrical signals. The light sensitive cells generate electrical signals. These signals are sent to the brain via the optic nerves. The brain interprets the signals and finally processes the information so that we can perceive objects as they are. Do you know, Colum, damage to or malfunction of any part of the visual system can lead to significant loss of visual functioning. For example, if any of the structures involved in the transmission of light like the cornea, pupil, eye lenses, aqueous humor and vitreous humor or those responsible for conversion of light to electrical impulse like the retina or even the optic nerves that transmits these impulses to the brain is damaged it will result in visual impairment. You might have experienced that you are not able to see objects clearly for some time when you enter from bright light to a room with dim light. After some time, however, you may be able to see things in the dim lit room. The pupil of the eye acts like a variable aperture whose size can be varied with the help of the iris. When the light is bright, the iris contracts the pupil to allow less light to enter the eye. However, in dim light, the iris expands the pupil to allow more light to enter the eye. Let me repeat that. In dim light, the iris expands the pupil and in bright light, the iris contracts the pupil. Thus, the pupil opens completely through the relaxation of the iris. Topic 11.1.1 Power of Accommodation The eye lens is composed of a fibrous jelly-like material. Its curvature can be modified to some extent by the ciliary muscles. The change in the curvature of the eye lens can thus change its focal length. The change in the curvature of eye lens can change the focal length.
When the muscles are relaxed, the lens becomes thin. Thus, its focal length increases. This enables us to see distinct objects clearly. When you are looking at objects closer to the eye, the ciliary muscles contract. This increases the curvature of the eye lens. The eye lens then becomes thicker. Consequently, the focal length of the eye lens decreases. This enables us to see nearby objects clearly. The ability of the eye lens to adjust to its focal length is called accommodation. However, the focal length of the eye lens cannot be decreased below a certain minimum limit. Try to read a printed page by holding it very close to your eyes. You may see the image being blurred or feeling strained in the eye. To see an object comfortably and distinctly, you must hold it at about 25 centimeters from the eyes. The minimum distance at which objects can be seen most distinctly without strain is called the least distance of distinct vision. Let me repeat that. The minimum distance at which objects can be seen most distinctly without strain is called the least distance of distinct vision. It is also called the near point of eye. The distance of distinct vision is called the near point of eye. For a young adult with normal vision, the near point is about 25 centimeters. The furthest point up to which the eye can see objects clearly is called the far point of the eye. It is infinite for a normal eye. You may note here a normal eye can see objects clearly that are between 25 centimeters and infinity. Sometimes the crystalline lens of people at old age becomes milky and cloudy. This condition is called cataract. Let me repeat that. The crystalline lens of people at old age becomes milky and cloudy and this condition is called the cataract. Cataract causes partial or complete loss of vision. It is possible to restore vision through a cataract surgery. Do you know, Colum, why do we have two eyes for vision and not just one? There are several advantages of our having two eyes instead of one. It gives us a wider field of view. A human being has a horizontal field of view of about 150 degree with one eye and of 180 degree with two eyes. The ability to detect faint objects is, of course, enhanced with two detectors instead of one. Some animals, usually prey animals, have their eyes positioned on opposite sides of their heads to give the widest possible field of view. But our eyes are positioned in the front of our heads and thus reduces our field of view in favor of what is called stereopsis. Shut one eye and the world looks flat, two-dimensional. Keep both eyes open and the world takes on the three dimension of depth. Because our eyes are separated by a few centimeters, each eye sees a slightly different image. Our brain combines the two images into one using the extra information to tell us how close or far away things are. Topic 11.2 Defects of vision and their correction Sometimes the eye may gradually lose its power of accommodation. In such conditions, the person cannot see the objects distinctly and comfortably. The vision becomes blurred due to the refractive defects of the eye. There are mainly three common refractive defects of vision. These are myopia or nearsightedness, hypermetropia or farsightedness, and presbyopia. Let me repeat that. There are mainly three common refractive defects of vision. Refractive defects of vision. Hypermetropia or farsightedness, myopia or nearsightedness, and presopia. These defects can be corrected by use of suitable spherical lenses. We discuss below these defects and their correction. A. Myopia. Myopia is also known as nearsightedness. A person with myopia can see nearby objects clearly but cannot see distinct objects distant objects distinctly. So, a person with myopia can see the near objects but cannot see the objects that are far away. So, myopia or nearsightedness is with a person who can see the objects that are nearby. A person with such defect has the far point nearer than infinity. Such a person may clearly see up to the distance of a few meters. In a myopic eye, the image of a distant object is formed in front of the retina and not at the retina itself. Let me repeat this. In a myopic eye, the image of a distant object is formed in front of the retina but not at the retina itself and this defect may arise due to a excessive curvature of eye lens or elongation of the eyeball. These defects can be corrected by using a concave lens of suitable power. So there are two reasons for myopic eye. First is excessive curvature of the eye lens or second the elongation of the eyeball. Excessive curvature of eye lens basically means that your eyes become more curved as in imagine your eyes are a sphere and then press that sphere from up and down. So you get a kind of oval shape with more area on the front and back of the eye. So the light reaches 
not till the retina. You see this red dot on the second diagram? That is the retina. So your light cannot reach till that. That is excessive curvature. And elongation of eyeball is basically when your eyeball becomes more thinner. So that was for the short explanation. These defect, this defect can be corrected by using a concave lens of suitable power. Power. A concave lens of suitable power will bring the image back on the retina and thus defect is corrected. The third diagram, correction for myopia, C diagram shows you how a concave lens will help your eye to make the light reach the end of the retina, at the retina. Next, B, hypermetropia. Hyper, hypermetropia is also known as fast sightedness. A person with hypermetropia can see distinct objects clearly but cannot see nearby objects distinctly. The near point of the person is further away from the normal near point that is 25 centimeters. The normal near point of an average person is 25 centimeters and a person with hypermetropia cannot see objects that are kept nearer to them than 25 centimeters. Such a person has to keep a reading material much beyond 25 centimeters from the eye for comfortable reading. This is because the, the light rays for um, a close by object are focused at a point behind the retina. This defect arises either because the focal length of the eye lens is too long or the eyeball has become too small. So unlike the previous problem that was myopia, where the eyeball became more like an oval shaped, so the focal length was small. So unlike myopia, here the eyeball has become too small. In myopia, the problem was that the retina and the lens were too far away and here they are too close. So in myopia, the problems were elongated eyeball or excessive curvature of eye lens. Whereas in hypermetropia, the problems are the focal length of the eye lens is too long or the eyeball has become too small. This defect can be corrected by using convex lens of appropriate power. Eyeglasses with converging lenses provide the additional focusing power required for forming the image on the retina. Third problem, presbyopia. The power of accommodation of the eye usually decreases with aging. For most people, the near point gradually recedes away. They find it difficult to see nearby objects comfortably and distinctly without corrective eye glasses. This defect is called presbyopia. It arises due to the gradual weakening of the ciliary muscles and diminishing flexibility of the eye lens. Sometimes a person may suffer from both myopia and hypermetropia. Such people often require bifocal lens. A common type of bifocal lenses consists of both concave and convex lenses. The upper portion consists of a concave lens. It facilitates distance vision. The lower part is a convex lens. It facilitates near vision. These days, it is possible to correct the refractive defects with contact lenses or through surgical intervention. Question. What is meant by power of accommodation of an eye? Power of accommodation is the ability of the eye lens to focus near and far objects clearly on the retina by adjusting its focal length. Let me repeat that. Power of accommodation is the ability of the eye lens to focus near and far objects clearly on the retina by adjusting its focal length. Second question. A person with a myopic eye cannot see objects beyond 1.2 meter distinctly. What should be the type of corrective lens used to restore proper vision? Concave lens are the corrective lens that a person with myopic eye who cannot see objects beyond 1.2 meters should use. Third question, what is the far point and near point of the human eye with normal vision? The far point of human eye with normal vision is infinite and the near point of the human eye with normal vision is 25 centimeters. Fourth question, a student has difficulty reading a blackboard while sitting in the last row. What could be the defect the child is suffering from? How can it be corrected? The child is suffering from myopia. How can it be corrected? By using concave lens. Think it over. You talk of wondrous things you see. You say the sun shines bright. I feel him warm. But how can he? Or make it day or night? By C. Sibur. Do you know that our eyes can live even after our death? By donating our eyes, we die. After we die, we can light the life of a blind person. About 35 million people in the developing world are blind and most of them can be cured. About 4.5 million people with corneal blindness can be cured through corneal transplantation of donated eyes. 
out of this 4.5 million, 60% are children below the age of 12. So if we have got the gift of vision, why not pass it on to somebody who does not have it? What do we have to keep in mind when eyes have to be donated? Eye donors can belong to any age group or sex. People who use spectacles or those operated for cataract can still donate the eyes. People who are diabetic, have hypertension, asthma patients and those without communicable diseases can also donate eyes. Eyes must be removed within 4 to 6 hours after death. Inform the nearest eye bank immediately. The eye bank team will remove the eyes at the home of the deceased or at a hospital. Eye removal takes only 10 to 15 minutes. It is a simple process and does not lead to any disfigurement. People who were infected with or died because of AIDS, hepatitis B or C, rabies, acute leukemia, tetanus, cholera, meningitis or encephalitis cannot donate eyes. An eye bank collects, evaluates and distributes the donated eyes. All eyes donated are evaluated using strict medical standards. Those donated eyes found unsuitable for transplantation are used for valuable research and medical education. The identities of both the donor and the recipient remain confidential. One pair of eyes gives vision to up to four corneal blind people. Okay, so some of you might ask, how can one pair of eyes give vision to four different people? Well, eyes have many things in them, retina, iris, cornea. So basically, when you divide this part, you can give vision to four different blind people. Topic 11.3, refraction of light through a prism. You have learned how light gets refracted through a rectangular glass slab for parallel refracting surfaces. As in a glass slab, the immersion tray is parallel to the incident tray. However, it is slightly di displaced laterally. How would light get refracted through a transparent prism? Consider a triangular glass prism. It has two triangular bases and three rectangular lateral surfaces. These surfaces are inclined to each other. The angle between its two lateral faces is called angle of the prism. Let us now use, do an activity to study the refraction of light through a triangular glass prism. Activity 11.1. .1. Fix a sheet of white paper on a drawing board using drawing pins. Place a glass prism on it in such a way that it rests on its rectangular base. Trace the outline of the prism using a pencil. Draw a straight line PE inclined to one of the refracting surfaces, say AB of the prism. Fix two points, say at point P and Q on the line PE as shown in the figure. Look for the images of the pins fixed at P and Q through the other face AC. Fix two more pins at points R and S such that the pins at R and S and the images of the pins at P and Q lie on the same straight line. Remove the pins and glass prism. The line PE meets the boundary of the prism at point E. Similarly, the join, join and produce the points R and S. Let those lines meet the boundary of the prism at E and F respectively. Join E and F. Draw perpendiculars to the refracting surfaces AB and AC of the prism at point, point E and F respectively. Mark the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction and the angle of emergence as shown in the figure. You don't have to think so much. Just look at the diagram once and you might recognize it quite very well. Now, the context. Here, PE is the incident ray, EF is the refracted ray, and FS is the emergent ray. You may note that a ray of light is entering from air to glass at the first surface A, B. The light ray on refraction has bent towards the normal. At the second surface, AC, the light ray has entered from glass to air. Okay, so this sentence, the light ray on refraction has bent towards the normal. Here, the normal is the N and N dash. Can you see it? The line which is at the incident ray E and the refraction angle, the N and N dash. That is the normal. Next, at the second surface AC, the light ray has entered from glass to air. Here, the normal is M dash and M. Hence, it has bent away from the normal. Compare the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction at each refracting surface of the prism. Is it similar to the kind of bending that occurs in a glass lab? The peculiar shape of the prism makes the emergent ray bend at an angle to the direction of the incident ray. This angle is called the angle of deviation. In this case, angle D is the angle of deviation. Mark the angle of deviation in the above activity and measure it. So basically, the shape of prism allows the light ray to diverge. And how much it diverges is basically important. By diverge, I mean how much exactly does the light ray bend towards the incident ray after it crosses the first normal, that is the N and N dash line. 
Next topic, 11.4, dispersion of white light by a glass prism. You must have seen and appreciated the spectacular colors in a rainbow. How could the white light of the sun give us various colors of the rainbow? Before we take up this question, we shall first go back to the refraction of light through prism. The inclined refracting surfaces of a glass prism show exciting phenomenon. Let us find it out through an activity. Activity 11.2, take a thick sheet of cardboard and make a small hole or narrow slit in its middle. Allow sunlight to fall on the narrow slit. This gives a narrow beam of white light. Now take a glass prism and allow the light from the slit to pass on one of its faces. Turn the prism slowly until the light that comes out of it appears on a nearby screen. What do you observe? You will find a beautiful band of colors. Why does it happen? This prism has probably split the incident white ray into a band of colors. Note the colors that appear at the two ends of the color band. What is the sequence of colors that you see on the screen? The various colors seen are violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red, as shown in figure 11.5. The acronym WIBJOR will help you remember the sequence of colors. The band of the colored components of a light beam is called its spectrum. Let me repeat that. The band of the colored components of the light beam is called a spectrum. You might not be able to see all the colors separately, yet something makes each color distinct from each other. The splitting of light into its component colors is called dispersion. The splitting of light in these distinct colors is called dispersion. And the band of these colors is called a spectrum. You have seen that white light is dispersed into its seven color components by a prism. Why do we get these colors? Different colors of light bend through different angles with respect to the incident ray as they pass through a prism. The red light bends the least, while the violet bends the most. Thus, the rays of each color emerge along different paths and thus become distinct. So what is the very main reason that white light becomes this colorful band of light? Because each color, that is red, violet, blue, green, yellow, they all have different deviation angles. So because of that, the red light bends very little because its angle of deviation is very little, whereas the violet light bends a lot because its angle of deviation is a lot. It can basically deviate a lot. That's its property, the color's property. Different colors of light bend through different angles with respect to the incident ray as they pass through a prism. The red light bends the least while the violet the most. Thus, the rays of each color emerge along different paths and become distinct. It is the band of distinct colors that we see in a spectrum. Isaac Newton was the first to use a glass prism to obtain the spectrum of sunlight. He tried to split the colors of the spectrum of white light further by using another similar prism. However, he could not get any more colors. He then placed the second identical prism in an inverted position with respect to the first prism. As shown in the figure, this allowed all the colors of spectrum to pass through the second prism. He found the beam of white light emerging from the other side of second prism. So basically what's shown in the figure, that you, take a, that you take a triangle and you put another triangle, just this time, upside down by the first triangle, by the side of first triangle. So when you do that, when the white light comes and goes through the first triangle, basically a prism, I'm just calling it a triangle, and then it goes again to the second triangle and then it went and then when it comes out of the second triangle it becomes a white light again that is what isaac newton did by placing a second identical prism in an inverted position with respect to the first prism so what happened white light came in the entire system and it went out as a white light this observation gave newton the idea that sunlight is made up of seven colors any light that gives a spectrum similar to that of sunlight is referred to as white light a rainbow is a natural spectrum appearing in the sky after a rain shower. It is caused by dispersion of sunlight by tiny water droplets present in the atmosphere. A rainbow is always formed in a direction opposite to that of sun. The water droplets act like small prisms. They refract and disperse the incident light. So if you see this diagram 11.8, you see that the sunlight comes inside the raindrop and here it gets refracted because it bends and then it, it gets dispersed. That is, the white light becomes or turns into many different colors as it goes out of the raindrop. And it's when it goes out of the raindrop, it is dispersing. When it is coming in, it is refracting. Due to the dispersion of light and internal reflection, different colors reach the observer's eye. You can also see a rainbow on a sunny day when you look at the sky through a waterfall or through a water fountain with the sun behind you. Topic 11.5, atmospheric refraction. You might have observed the apparent random wavering or flickering of objects 
seen through a turbulent stream of hot air rising above a fire or a radiator. The air just above the fire becomes hotter than the air further up. The hotter air is lighter, less dense than the cooler air above it and has a refractive index slightly less than that of cooler air. Since the physical conditions of the refracting medium, air, are not stationary, the apparent position of the object as seen through the hot air fluctuates. This wavering is thus an effect of atmospheric refraction, so refraction of light by Earth's atmosphere, on a small scale in our local environment. The twinkling of stars is a similar phenomenon on a larger scale. Let us see how we can explain it. Twinkling of stars. The twinkling of stars is due to atmospheric refraction of starlight. The starlight on entering the Earth's atmosphere undergoes refraction continuously before it reaches the Earth. The atmospheric refraction occurs in a medium of gradually changing refractive index. Since the atmospheric, since the atmosphere bends starlight towards the normal, the apparent position of the star is slightly different from its actual position. The star appears slightly higher than its actual position when viewed near the horizon. Further, this apparent position of the star is not stationary, but keeps on changing slightly since the physical conditions of the Earth's atmosphere are not stationary, as was the case in previous paragraph. Since these stars are very distant, they approximate point size source of light. As the path of rays of the light coming from the star goes on varying slightly, the apparent position of the star fluctuates and the amount of starlight entering the eye flickers. The star sometimes appears brighter and sometimes fainter, which is the twinkling effect. Why don't the planets why don't the planets twinkle? The planets are much closer to the Earth and are seen as extended sources. If we consider a planet as a collection of large number of point size sources of light, the total variation in the amount of light entering from all the individual point size sources will average out to zero, thereby nullifying the twinkling effect. So basically what these last lines are saying that if you consider the planet has many, 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 many dots, then all those dots twinkle at different times. So, if you take the entire object as a whole, you would actually see those small dots twinkling or those small dots getting fainter and small dots getting brighter. You will see the entire planet as a whole. Therefore, you will not see that entire planet twinkling. Next, advanced sunrise and delayed sunset. The sun is visible to us about two minutes before the actual sunrise and about two minutes after the actual sunset because of atmospheric refraction. By actual sunrise, we mean the actual crossing of the horizon by the sun shows the actual and apparent positions of sun with respect to the horizon. The time difference between actual sunset and apparent sunset is about two minutes. The apparent flattening of sun's disk at sunrise and sunset is also due to same phenomenon. So because of the refraction, you see the light before you are supposed to see it. That's cool. Topic 11.6, scattering of light. The interplay of light with objects around us gives rise to several spectacular phenomena in nature. The blue color of the sky, color of water in deep sea, the reddening of sun at sunrise and sunset are some of the wonderful phenomena we are familiar with. In the previous class, you have learned about the scattering of light by colloidal particles. The path of a beam of light passing through a true solution is not visible. However, its path becomes visible through a colloidal solution where the size of particles is relatively larger. Topic 11.6.1, Tyndall effect. The Earth's atmosphere is a heterogeneous mixture of minute particles. These particles include smoke, tiny water droplets, suspended particles of dust, and molecules of air. When a beam of light strikes such fine particles, the path of the beam becomes visible. The light reaches us after being reflected diffusely by these particles. The phenomenon of scattering of light by the colloidal particles gives rise to Tyndall effect, which you have studied in class 9. This phenomenon is seen when a fine beam of sunlight enters a smoke field room through a small hole. The scattering of light becomes makes the particles visible. Tyndall effect can also be observed when sunlight passes through a canopy of a dense forest. Here, tiny water droplets in the mist scatter light. The color of the scattered light depends on the size of scattered particles. Very fine particles scatter mainly blue light, while particles of larger size scatter light of longer wavelengths. If the size of the scattering particles is large enough, then the scattered light may even appear white. Topic 11.6.2 why is the color of the clear sky blue? The molecules of air and other fine particles in the atmosphere have size smaller than wavelength of visible light. These are more effective in scattering light of shorter wavelengths at the blue end than light of longer wavelengths at the red end. The red light has a wavelength of about 1.8 times greater than blue light. Thus, when sunlight passes through the atmosphere, the fine particles in air scatter the blue light shorter wavelengths more strongly than red. The scattered blue light enters our eyes. 
If the earth had no atmosphere, there would not have been any scattering. Then the sky would have looked dark. The sky appears dark to passengers flying at very high altitudes, as scattering is not prominent, prominent at such heights. You might have observed that danger signal lights are red in color. Do you know why? The red is least scattered by fog or smoke. Therefore, it can be seen in the same color at a distance. Topic 11.6.3 Color of the sun at sunrise and sunset Have you seen the sky and the sun at sunrise and sunset? Have you wondered as to why the sun and the surrounding sky appear red? Let us do an activity to understand the blue color of sky and the reddish appearance, appearance of the sun at the sunrise or sunset. Activity 11.3 Place a strong source of white light at the focus of a converging lens. The lens provides a parallel beam of light. Allow the light beam to pass through a transparent glass tank containing clear water. Allow the beam of light to pass through a circular hole made in a cardboard. Obtain a sharp image of the circular hole on the screen MN using a second converging lens L2 as shown in the figure. This was about 200 grams of sodium thiosulfate hypo in about 2 liters of clean water taken in the tank. Add about 1 to 2 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid to the water. What do you observe? You will find fine microscopic sulfur particles precipitating in about 2 to 3 minutes. As the sulfur particles begin to form, you can observe the blue light from the three sides of the glass tank. This is due to scattering of short wavelengths by minute colloidal sulfur particles. By minute, they mean here small, very small. Observe the color of transmitted light from the fourth side of the glass tank facing the circular hole. It is interesting to observe at first the orange red color and then bright crimson color on the screen. This activity demonstrates the scattering of light that helps you understand the bluish color of sky and the reddish appearance of the sun at sunrise or sunset. Light from sun near the horizon passes through thicker layers of air and larger distance in the Earth's atmosphere before reaching our eyes. However, light from the sun overhead would travel relatively shorter distance. At noon, the sun appears white as only a little of blue and violet light. Colors are scattered. Near the horizon, most of the blue light and shorter wavelengths are scattered away by the particles. Therefore, the light that up reaches our eyes is of longer wavelengths. This gives rise to the reddish appearance of the 